Welcome to the Strive Seek Find podcast with me, Tom Heaton. Let's run a little thought experiment. Your anaesthetist comes to talk to you before your surgery. Following his thorough yet efficient preoperative assessment, he tells you that it may be possible that his anaesthetic is simply a perfect amnesic agent. You could potentially experience the entire operation in the moment, unable to move and do anything about it, but at the end you would have absolutely no recollection of these events. You would wake up, as it were, from the anaesthetic with a perfect gap in your episodic memory, to all intents and purposes a period of unconsciousness. No one would know if you had experienced anything, particularly you, and it would be exactly as if you hadn't. But maybe you had. Would this bother you? And if it did, why? This question has come to me before when I've been studying the problem of awareness under anaesthesia, but it subsequently cropped up again during a tutorial on the philosophical topic of personal identity. When we think about what it means to be the same person, there are a few surprisingly challenging questions that arise. One line of reasoning, particularly forwarded by Locke, puts a strong emphasis on the continuation of personal identity being dependent on the psychological continuity of the person. Memory is almost certainly the foremost of these psychological factors, although not the only one, which leads us into some of these interesting conundrums. If you have absolutely no psychological connection to the person that experienced the event, for example, absolutely no memory of it, did that happen to you or not? Let's dive into some of the conflicting intuitions I have on this topic. My first instinct is that of course it matters. As a conscious agent, I would be aware of someone sticking a knife into me, manipulating internal parts of my body, and then sewing me up, all the while being unable to move. The process of imagining what this would be like is quite unpleasant, and gives me additional empathy towards anyone that's experienced awareness under anaesthesia. It is not something that I would wish on myself or anyone else, and would fill me with a dread of having to have an operation if I knew that this was what happened. However, I must then ask myself, maybe this has happened to me. I have had an operation for which I had an anaesthetic. I have complete amnesia of the period of my general anaesthetic and some of the recovery period afterwards, and that is all I can actually say about the event. From my perspective, the contrasting alternative experience of myself at the time, unconscious versus aware but amnesic, are genuinely indistinguishable from each other. If I had had the complete amnesia experience, then I now genuinely don't care about it, primarily because, from my current perspective, it didn't actually happen to me. It seems that in order for it to happen to me, the current me who is sat here speaking, it does seem to need to be psychologically connected to my current self. I can raise a similar question for when we sleep. I don't remember my non-REM sleep, or, or much of my REM sleep, and yet my brain is very active at this time. Am I conscious of any of this neuronal activity, and simply amnesic of it, or am I genuinely unconscious throughout? Though perhaps this example says more about the mysteries of sleep and consciousness than anything else. Either way, I don't have any psychological connection to this sleeping version of me, and it doesn't seem to bother me if I happen to routinely spend these hours in torment as my brain reorganises itself and deletes my memory of the period. To bring this abstract thought experiment closer to reality, I feel that I have seen cases like this during my anaesthetic training. Some cases of conscious sedation, where the goal is not to achieve full anaesthesia, appear to be having consciousness at the time of certain procedures, as evidenced by appropriate motor activity, but profess absolutely no recall afterwards. I've even seen an example where they were still awaiting the procedure that had already happened. Admittedly, the complete unawareness of the procedure was not part of what was offered by the sedationist, something that I am very clear about myself in the consent process for any conscious sedation that I do, but they do seem to have still managed up with the same final outcome as our general anaesthesia case. I can see that I've not done a detailed follow-up to analyse how dense this amnesia truly was, but the point remains. And much more commonly than these cases are when we routinely see the preservation of the nociceptive response to noxious stimuli in patients who are under general anaesthesia. It is only retrospectively that we can truly label these as nociception rather than pain when we establish there was no conscious component to it. However, there is clearly a neurologically mediated physiological response going on here, which, if we are physicalists about the nature of consciousness, is all that consciousness really is. We are simply much more reassured that consciousness isn't present by the visible correlates of this, the absence of appropriate motor activity, the presence of associated EEG patterns, if we're monitoring these, and, the topic of this podcast, the lack of any recall after the event. Indeed, some motor reflexes appear to persist despite deep levels of anaesthesia, something that gave me quite a shot when I first started my anaesthetic training. 
Even now, I get a bit of a jump when I see an unexpected spike in my depth of anaesthesia monitoring, despite my confidence in the depth of anaesthesia that I have. This leaves the absence of a recall of the events as the gold standard of our anaesthetic, with a problematically retrospective nature to it. All of this brings me to a sense that, although we are pretty convinced that people are not conscious here, much of this is founded on these visible correlates. The biggest reassurance is the very reliable lack of recall, but this is identical in the two alternative situations initially described. This therefore brings me back to the relevance of the second question, should we care? When I think about this question, I get a very strange sense of time dependency to it. It is me when the event is in the future, I am concerned about what I will have to experience, but it is not me when the event has passed. I don't even know that anything has happened. My answer is therefore somewhat dependent on when you ask me, although I would still tend towards saying that it does matter. Even if the past me feels very separate from the current me, I can still imagine that his experience is an unpleasant one to go through, and I have some empathy with this stranger. This would seem to negate the argument of amnesia, given that someone has to go through the experience, even if that person doesn't really exist anymore after the event as the amnesia kicks in. In my mind, it is probably this factor that we need to weigh most strongly when we are considering the second question. Someone is suffering, and this seems ethically undesirable. To summarise, I think there are some fascinating questions thrown up by this thought experiment, highlighting some of the real complexities of consciousness, personal identity, memory, and the mysteries of anaesthesia. I am personally quite swayed by the importance of psychological continuity as a core part of our personal identity, and this has left me a bit puzzled over the significance of the different theoretical cases here. However, it seems clear that the presence of any consciousness during such an unpleasant event as surgery is highly undesirable, regardless of its duration or impermanence. Indeed, this is part of the brilliance of anaesthesia. It is a central part of our role as anaesthetists to be able to bring about this true unconsciousness, and it is clear that amnesia is not good enough, no matter how confident we could be with it. It seems a rare scenario when we'd be forced into this problem, but it should still remain a guiding principle to our clinical approach. Thank you for listening. To keep up to date and to follow my writings, subscribe to me on Substack, which is striveseekfind.substack.com or follow me on X at 2striveseekfind.com